Good morning, everyone. Um, if you've got the sheet, it's got the psalm on it, or maybe a Bible, that will really, really help you as we just try, try and kind of pull together what we've just heard. Um, on this subject of generosity, uh, what we've been learning is that behind all the generosity that we experience or see around us stands the generosity of God. But alongside that generosity of God, there is this huge elephant in the room, the suffering of this world. How do you put these two things together? A generous God and a suffering world. Well, people have written big, big books about how you reconcile those two things together. But of course, suffering is never just a puzzle. It's never just a question you've just got to kind of get sorted out in your head. Suffering is a practical problem. The one thing you can be sure about is that you may need to seek many things in this world. You will never need to seek suffering. It will find you. Suffering is a practical problem. And when you open the Bible, it doesn't give us intellectual answers about God and suffering. It gives you practical illustrations of what God is to people in suffering places. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. David is a multi-talented individual. He's a warrior king. He's a poet musician. He's a skillful shepherd. But alongside that, he is a man of immense suffering. I don't know if this is an overstatement, but maybe he's the man who more people in this world wanted to kill than anybody else. King Saul, with his army, wanted to destroy him. The Philistines wanted to kill him. At one point in his experience, his own men wanted to pick up stones and stone him. And ultimately, his own son turned against him and wanted to take his life. This is a man who knows what suffering looks like. And he has written for us this psalm. So I'm going to read the psalm. Think about who it is that pens these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, we've got a bit of an edge as we kind of open this sum up, because the second part of the Bible gives a glimpse of the face of the shepherd. So we know that the shepherd Jesus that David is talking about is in fact the Lord Jesus Christ. He describes himself as the good shepherd. Here's the first thing. Suffering brings uncertainty. So have a look at that little phrase at the beginning of verse 3 where it says, he restores my soul. The soul, your soul is that internal world where the questions and the doubts and sometimes the guilt lands. You might have a nice smiley face, but underneath the surface, uncertainty lurks and suffering accentuates those questions. So Saul turns David's life into that of a fugitive. He's like a defenseless sheep that's been pursued by a pack of wolves. And he flees across mountains and hides in caves and he feels himself a step away from death. And internally he is weary 
He's ready to throw the towel in. Now, for us, it may be a different kind of set of circumstances. We've listened today as Morag's talked about her own physical difficulties and Kirsten's talked about family tragedy. Might be, might be illness, might be injustice, might be some other kind of loss, but it brings uncertainty into your soul. Has God abandoned me? Am I being punished? Have I imagined the whole thing? So where do you find restoration for your soul in these times of uncertainty? This is David's experience. While David was at Horesh, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him to find strength in God. Don't be afraid. My father will not lay a hand on you. You shall be king over Israel. You get the scene? This king with his army is searching for David. Where is he? Let's get a hold of him. But David's friend, Jonathan, knows exactly where he is. And he goes to him and he strengthens him by reminding him of the word of God and the promise of God. You will be king over Israel. That is what God has said. The Lord knows where his struggling people are. And you discover that by means of the appropriateness of the word of God. That's what Morag was sharing with us earlier today. It is an amazing and wonderful thing that God, through this, this old book, hundreds of pages, thousands of words, can organize to direct your attention to precisely the encouraging word that you need to hear. Now just think about that for a second. Maybe on the morning of the operation. Maybe in the sadness of your breaking heart. Maybe in, uh, in your time of fear for your children. And Jonathan arrives. The shepherd takes his sheep to the green pastures of his words. The Lord restores our souls. And the words, of the, the words on the page of the Bible just come at us with powerful relevance and reassurance. Let me put it to you like this. Reading that specific word, it, word that is just appropriate to your set of circumstances is no more spectacular than if God turned up that morning and stood at the bottom of your bed and said to you, this is my promise to you. Now, sometimes God very kindly just brings that word across our path in some way. But what I want to say to you is, there is no more important thing than investing time in systematically and thoughtfully reading the scriptures that at your moment of suffering, bingo, the word of God arrives. Jonathan comes and helps you find strength in God. He restores our soul. Number two, suffering promotes fear. And there are some pretty big, scary fears out there. Being a Christian is not a past or trouble-free life, as you've heard today. And as much as this shepherd will lead his sheep along paths of righteousness, this shepherd will lead his sheep into the valley of the shadow of death. Now, pretty obviously, we're all going to end up there at some point. And we are sheep, whether we like it or not. Uh, 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 the implication of that is that we're all followers in here. We're all following somebody or something. Following the right shepherd is everything. So during the Second World War, there was a famous battle fought at the end of 1942 and into 1943 in a place called Stalingrad in the USSR. 
Initially, Germany prevailed. They almost destroyed the whole of Stalingrad uh, in their attack. But then the tables turned and they find themselves cut off and surrounded by the Russian army. Letters remain written by young German soldiers to their families. Very moving letters. They're caught in this, this trap and they write home. And they assure their families that the Fuhrer, their great leader, would not abandon them, but would come to their rescue. They have great confidence in Adolf Hitler and his love for them. Tragically, they have misjudged the character of their shepherd. He's not a good shepherd. He's an arrogant, ruthless, deluded, deadly shepherd. There would be no rescue. They were left to their fate. The Fuhrer had moved on to other things. Now, you and I are not informed as to what is ahead of us. There's no insights being given to any of us today as to what is coming 2023, 24, 25. All of us are being urged to look to the character of our shepherd. Who is it we're following? I guess David's mind might have gone to the fact that this shepherd led his people through the wilderness in danger. He'd led them through enemies and battles to bring them safely to their promised destination. And he met their grumbling and faithlessness with patient endurance, not even their idolatry could cancel his steadfast love for these people. He had sustained them and rescued them. He had carried them all the way from Egypt to Canaan. That's his track record. Now, you and I live in a culture where people look to football or they look to money or they look to sexual adventure or they look to some other substance to deliver life. All of these things can lead you into the valley, but they can't lead you through the valley. In John's gospel, Jesus performs seven miracles in the first 11 chapters, and the seventh miracle is by far and away the most important miracle of the lot, the raising of Lazarus. Maybe you know the background to the story. Jesus gets a message. Your friend Lazarus is ill. Jesus, <coughs> Jesus dies. Jesus doesn't move. He shows up too late. Four days, by, by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. It's almost as if Jesus has caused him to be in that place. But then he steps onto the stage. He goes to the Bethany Cemetery. He commands the stone is moved. He speaks the word, Lazarus, come out. And this man in his grave clothes shuffles out of the grave and goes on his way. Do you see the point? Jesus leads his sheep into the valley of death, as he did for Lazarus. But he led him through the valley of death. He is the only shepherd who can do that. Make sure you're following the right shepherd. Learn to... Uh, to Focus and concentrate on his character. Fear is the great fear, the great fear of death retreats in the face of the love and competence of the Lord our Shepherd. Here's the last thing. <coughs> Suffering scatters and separates people. Look at verse five. And in verse five, it speaks about enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, David knew all about physical enemies. But his most vicious enemy was not Saul, but Satan. And Satan had his successes against David, as he will against all of us. And suffering and sin makes people hide. They want to face people. It may kind of stir up that self-pity and critical spirit that just kind of makes us retreat. The suffering that we experience through sin makes us want to pull away, to get out of the firing line. 
But Satan always wins when he isolates believers. When David went out alone, when he rejected the advice of others, when he went with his heart, it usually didn't end well. But here is a place of provision for defeated believers. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, tables in the Bible are never places for meals for one. They're always places that gather people together. Maybe David is thinking of the Passover meal, you know, the meal they ate to remind, remind themselves of what God had done for them in Egypt. You and I kind of go a step further and we're reminded by Jesus of that evening of his crucifixion when he gathered his disciples together, took bread and took wine and broke it and gave it to them. It gathers us and it pulls us in and it confronts us with the generosity of God and shows us where safety is found. It's not found in arming yourself with a sword and trying to make out that you're a better disciple than everybody else in the room. It's what Peter did. Safety is found in listening to Jesus who says, a new command I give to you that you love one another. It's found in corporate life. It's found in serving each other. It's found in praying for one another. Don't neglect the help that the Lord has put in place for his suffering people. His day, his family, his table. But notice where the psalm ends. Notice where it lands. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here's a man whose life has been full of unwelcome visitors, but who emerges at the end of it, not resentful and bitter, but convinced that the only thing the shepherd will allow to follow him all the days of his life is goodness and mercy. No demons, no spiritual debts, no overwhelming crises. Nothing will stop him getting to his destination. And the conclusion of the psalm is the first line of the psalm. So if you can say, the Lord is my shepherd, you can also say, I will lack nothing. 